Don't Harass the Seagrass is actually a campaign originating through Barnegat Bay Partnership. And I'm going to show you some of the products that they've produced for that. But it's a really great education tool that has been developed in order to raise awareness about the resource and kind of those things that would be important for the average person to do to help out and preserve that resource. So on the left hand side, you see some of the funding agencies, my research lab logo. If you're at all into social media, I have um, the my Instagram page is Stockton underscore Merle, and that stands for the Marine Ecosystem Research Laboratory. And so that's the lab that I run my research with my students in and um, have, have really enjoyed developing these programs with the students in mind. And then also, of course, sharing what I love about um, the communities that I work in. So thank you again for inviting me and uh, I'm going to take you on a, a little ride through um, what I love doing, uh, which is working in some of these near shore seagrass beds. And the first thing I like to do is I found that there's a lot of confusion about what's a seagrass versus a seaweed. Um, and I mean, they're both aquatic plants. And so I think for a lot of people, that's where that distinction ends. Um, but they're really fundamentally very different and they have different roles within the community. So I want to spend a little bit of time just giving you that primer so that next time you're walking on the beach, you'll know, oh, that's a seaweed, that's a seagrass. Uh, then talk a bit about why they're so important, the services that they provide both for people and for animals, and then how they're threatened. And then I kind of have a break built in there. But as I said before, I'm happy to take questions as we go. And then I'm going to talk about two studies. One is running the SAV monitoring program. And SAV stands for submerged aquatic vegetation. And so that's kind of a catch all term for in our region, the two types of seagrass that we have, which is Wigian grass and eelgrass. And then I'll be talking about the restoration. So we know that we've lost some seagrass and there are some attempts. We obviously want to protect and preserve those areas we have, but in regions that maybe would be fair, favorable for us to go out planting seagrass in some way, shape, or form, um, what does that even look like? So that being said, first weed versus grass. <laughs> so yes, seaweed versus seagrass in this case. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see algae and on the right-hand side, you see seagrass. And so fundamentally, you know, they're, especially for the green algae, they're gonna look somewhat similar. So they have this blade area for the algae, um, which is somewhat equivalent when you're thinking overall structure to the leaves. Then we have the stipe, which is kind of like a stem, and the holdfast, which looks somewhat like the roots. But visually, that's about where it stops um, because these don't really perform the same function. So on an algal blade, our seaweed in this case, the, that whole holdfast stipe blade, all of that tissue is all involved with photosynthesis and uptake of nutrients for growth. So they're capturing rays of sun, they're using the energy in the water, the nutrients to absorb that in order to grow. Versus when we look at our seagrass, photosynthesis is only happening in those green bits that are above the soil lawn. And so it's, a, it's like the grass, you can think of it as the grass on your lawn. So just like you have to water your grass and put nutrients down, fertilizer, that nutrient uptake is only happening at this root rhizome area. We also have something different in that the seagrass actually has flowers. So I always joke with my marine botany students that if they brought me a bouquet of seagrass flowers, you know, they get bonus points with me. Um, but it's actually kind of difficult to find seagrass flowers. They're a lot more reduced in size because your pollinator really isn't like, you're not looking for birds and bees to do the pollination. Instead, you're thinking about things like wind. There's fruits that form for some of the seagrasses as well. Um, so there are herbivores, so plant-eating fish that come through and can actually target that type of fruit within the seagrass. And so that's where some of those seeds get dispersed. And we'll talk a bit more about seeds when we talk about the restoration strategy. So superficially, they look very different, but they're fundamentally how they gain nutrients, how they grow, how they reproduce, because algae itself, they produce spores in the water column, and then fragments of them can break off and create more plants. Um, so fundamentally, these two are very different from one another, so much that you can't even really call them cousins. So when you're looking on the beach, um, here we have an example of some eelgrass, which the genus is Zostra. Um, so you can see, you know, it looks pretty typical to your lawn, these long blades. Now, when that washes up on shore, it's a lot darker, it's dried out, 
Um, so you might not necessarily recognize it, but this would be an example of seagrass. Whereas this, this is where it starts to get confused with seaweed, if seagrass and seaweed. So this is a seaweed. And some of the clues are, you know, it's definitely attached to a rock rather than in the soil. So remember those seagrass plants need that soil for that root to be there. So these have cold fast, but really thin and fine and looks like hair almost. Um, this one's another example of a seaweed. Uh, the common name for this guy is dead man fingers. <laughs> uh, so this is an example where you could, could get confused, especially once again, as you wash up on shore. This is an example of the Wigian grass. So Rupia is the genus of this. And so, you know, these are very thin, fine blades that form the canopy in the water column for plants and animals, nursery habitat, um, adding to the ecosystem. So this is another example of a seaweed. You can see how it looks kind of similar. So it's understandable as these start to wash up on the beach, people could get confused about them. And the important reason why I want you to know what the grass versus a weed is that they have very different purposes. Um, and seaweed is the one that comes in big blooms, gets caught in your props at the boat, washes up on shore. If you live in a tropical environment, you'll have sargassum or gulf weed that's floating up on the beaches. And so it gets a bad rap because, well, it smells pretty funky and no one really wants to lay their towel on it because there's a lot of insects that live in it. It forms an important part of the community because then birds are feeding on that. But when there's too much of it, it's kind of a bad thing for our community. This is an example of a agar redweed. Stan, I think your microphone's on if you want to mute that. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, and then these are two examples that I think are definitely not as easily confused with seagrass. And so on the left, this one's called sea lettuce, which I think is aptly named. Very a tasty treat for, for herbivores, for plant eaters. And then this one on the right is called rockweed. And it has these really special air bladders that help it float up in the water column, similar to the gulf weed that you see. So that's kind of your primer. So when you're out at the beach um, and you find some of these things in the water, you can certainly rehydrate them. That helps you identify you know, that where it looks more like a blade of grass versus there's not really a strong root or there's not really a structure to it. So that's one of the ways that you can start identifying them. I encourage you to collect them. You can press them in books. And um, when people used to do this, right, botanical prints, I curated an art show when I lived down in Florida and it was the basis of some of my herbarium presses. And so it's interesting to see that people still do that as a pastime now. So you, know, you can't do out go out and do much now, but if you can turn these into works of art, and I actually own quite a few fun pieces where people have turned pressings um, into pictures. So the other important thing that the seagrass is, so now to shift focus from sea, seaweed and seagrass to just looking at seagrass, are the food webs that they contribute to. So they're the base of that food chain. So if you like to eat scallop, if you like blue crab, flounder, any of those commercially important and recreationally important species, you want to thank your seagrass bed for forming that nursery habitat. So they're really vital to the community. And this is a, it's pretty simplified. It's from one of the textbooks that I've used to teach courses. Um, and I even had to add in some things because it doesn't quite encapsulate it all. And if you've ever looked at um, a scientific food web, it's, it's definitely a web for a reason. Um, so you can see kind of towards the center is where you have these basal producers. So at the bottom of the food chain, um, the seagrass being one of them, some of the larger algae, so the macro algae part of it can form structure that larval fish can attach to. So that macro algae, once again, isn't only a bad thing just because it smells bad. Um, and then the other thing that I've, the other community I've worked with are with oysters um, and forming oyster reefs. So in our temperate environment, the oyster reefs are there, they're attached to the bottom, they're filtering the water and they're filtering out things like phytoplankton. And we know scallops in particular will settle on seagrass blades. So when there aren't seagrass blades, you don't have those communities of scallops, which are tasty, tasty treats. So our crabs are living in that environment. Um, you know, we have our higher uh, animals, the uh, sharks in this case, um, that are, are feeding at the fish level, the fish that are then consuming, you know, the, the potentially consuming plants directly or smaller fish, seabirds, and then of course us, at the very top of the food chain um, as we like to go out and go fishing in these communities. And I, so this is me with my bowl cut um, when, when I was a little kid, probably the last time I've been fishing. It's been a while. Um, so we all get out and enjoy these communities, but it's important to understand how they're all connected. And so if you throw off one of these, if you add too many nutrients in the water, 
you get these blooms of micro algae, which is different than this larger macro algae, but nutrients cause blooms, which can shade out seagrass and kill them off and cause a negative consequence. So to help see kind of how these things are connected, it's really important. The other thing to consider is how each of these benthic communities, these bottom communities are interacting with each other. And another area of my, as I mentioned before, another area of my research is looking at the seagrass seagrass shellfish interactions. So this little graphic I put together kind of hints at then what, what the benefits are. So we already established, you know, the, the seagrass alone is beneficial. They have their habitat, it's a canopy, it's a place for animals to find shelter, to, to reproduce, to grow. We know that we also get that with shellfish. So oysters here in this case, it's a hard substrate. So if an animal or um, some type of creature wants to use a hard versus a soft substrate, you've got a different type of structure there. But then that positive that they're giving to each other is that when the eelgrass is growing and putting its root down, roots down into the soil under the water, the subaqueous soil, it's stabilizing that soil so that it doesn't wash over onto our, our oysters and those oyster reefs and doesn't smother them out. Oysters, in turn, are filtering the water. So that's going to remove anything that might be in the water column or as much as possible out of the water column so that the seagrass can get a light um, to grow, right? Because they're plants, they're going to need that light. And then they also can you know, prevent, one of the things that we have issues with at times is uh, cow nose rays coming through. So really large schools of cow nose rays will come through an environment um, and completely disturb the seagrass, which causes problems. And then also um, the oyster reefs further uh, can stabilize the sediment. So once again, you know, you look at this one um, food web and, you know, it's got some of these players in it, but the interactions within just each one of those branchlets can be somewhat um, complicated or, or involved, you know, so whether or not we're adding, oops, we're just kind of considering the seagrass to oyster dynamic, but we could easily look at the seagrass to macroalgae dynamic. We can look at the seagrass to scallop dynamic. So part of the job of researchers is to try and tease apart what are those relationships. And if we lose one of these communities, what's going to be impacting all the other um, environments. Of course, when we think about other ways that seagrasses are forming an important community, it's also then what they're providing back for the community. So they're a food source, a habitat, nursery ground, but then also they're protecting the coastal property. So because of their presence, they're going to dampen the waves. So when we have these large storm events come through, we won't have as much a wave energy that's hitting just the, the, the beach area. First, the waves have to pass through these eelgrass beds or seagrass beds. It slows that down so that we don't lose that property. Um, there is some, um, that stabilization of sediment, so not necessarily removing the nutrients besides what they're using for their growth, but making sure that they're not resuspended. And then look at those values, right? $29.6 billion per year just in Barnegat Bay. Um, so comparatively, you know, Florida Bay is four to five times the size of Barnegat Bay. And so the services provided there, you know, obviously if we know how much seagrass is covering and things like that. Um, it's definitely, it definitely has a value. Um, so whether or not you want to protect it because you uh, enjoy the fish that you're eating out of it versus the tourism, the people bring the people here um, versus the coastal protection. So the seagrass beds are, are pretty well under that threat. We've known this for quite a while. Um, we've had issues with the nutrients um, being one of the major concerns. Sometimes it can be through fishing purposes, so being the destruction if people are coming in with destructive uh, fishing practices, dredging, things like that. Um, it's, like I said, pretty well established. And so these photos are obviously typical coastal degradation. Um, these were not taken in New Jersey, <laughs> um, despite, you know, the nice turquoise water we'd like to see. Uh, this is actually an outfall from the Proven Rum factory. So one of the projects I worked on was in, for environmental impact assessment. And so this outfall, um, yeah, you can see that there's nothing really growing around it. The smell there, I would say if there were smell vision you should experience it, but that would not be kind to you. Uh, but it definitely caused a dead zone in that environment because it's releasing a lot of those nutrients. Here, closer to home, we have the 10-point plan that came out um, and looking at how, how humans can then have a positive impact to restore some of these properties, the water quality being the main concern in Barnegat Bay, 
um, and we see kind of a gradient of that. So in the northern region of Barnegat Bay, it's uh, more heavily populated, so we have a lot more um, nutrient concerns with eutrophication. So that adding of nutrients, there's also less marshland. So that's another really important community for our environment. It's, I've heard it called before kind of the kidneys um, and that it's really filtering out, out a lot of what's going on. So luckily we're starting, not only are we aware that there's a problem, but we're enacting legislation and funding some of the projects to help address the threats that we see within the environment. And it comes down a lot to us. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. Um, overfishing is one of the examples. So once again, going back to that, that food lab, that trophic relationship um, is the idea that if we remove the fish, um, this canary in the coal mine idea is, okay, what will happen to our seagrass beds if we don't have the fish? And what story will it tell us? Because fish are mobile species, right? So they're moving through these environments. And you, you need to track them, you need to do demographics, you know, we'll get counts and age classes. But the seagrass being a, um, a kind of a sentinel species, the, the Marion coal mine means it's always in that same environment. And so when you start to see a decline in the seagrass, while that one time fish sampling might not tell you something's alarming, or that one time that you go out and gather uh, a water sample to test might not tell you anything's wrong because you have this grass that's growing throughout the year, it's constantly sampling the environment. So we can see some change happening if when you're removing the fish, as I mentioned before, if you add nutrients, that causes a couple different things. And when I, when I talk about my monitoring data, I'll look both at the drift macroalgae. So this little cartoon has kind of a cloud of drift algae over the surface of the water. Um, and then that obviously will shade out the seagrass. It's just like, if, you know, a tall tree starts growing over the grass in your lawn. You know, how can the plants actually respond to that? Uh, and then the last is looking at crop scars and blowouts. Um, and like I said before, um, I'll mention this a bit more when we talk about the restoration strategies, but that crop scar and blowout is part of the Don't Harass the Seagrass campaign. And I'll show you some of the fun graphics from that. The fisheries one, the, the cost um, and the, the value also came from the, the Barnaby Bay Partnership funded project for that. And so this is where I can put my teacher hat on if I if it wasn't on before. Uh, to talk a bit about so conservation theory. So if I can establish and hopefully I've convinced you that these are important communities that we should work on preserving, protecting, restoring, how do I get everyone else on board? Um, I argue that putting googly eyes on things <laughs> might be the best way uh, just to try and get people to, to buy into it, um, but uh, that doesn't always work for me. So there's three main ways. The first is this economic. So here's a little picture of um, some fishermen. And I said before, these commercially and recreationally important fish and shellfish, it's like this phrase that I feel like I could just say in my sleep. It's an important economy for our coastal communities. It's a livelihood. It's you know, something that you do with your children when you, know, you take them out to the beach and you pass on this like, legacy and this, this you know, positive emotion when it comes to um, what you want to do, that fishery industry is a very important. So the self-interest of, you know, to, to feed yourself on one level, but then also to supply funds so that you can have you know, the basic amenities of life. The other way you can appeal to some people is evolutionary. So in this case, oops, we're looking at, um, there we go. Uh, I like this uh, cover from National Geographic about reviving extinct species. There's actually one federally endangered seagrass species. It's called Johnson seagrass. Uh, and the hope is that it doesn't go extinct. Uh, Zostra itself, the eelgrass became close to extinction. There was a slime mold, believe it or not, that passed through in the 70s and 80s that wiped out a lot of the populations of eelgrass. And so there is this possibility that, you know, if we don't conserve what we have now, it might be gone forever. In our region, something interesting that I've been seeing, and while it does not mean that either are close to being extinct is that we have that the eelgrass and we have the Wigian grass and they overlap towards the middle portion of the bay and I'll get into that in the monitoring results. But there are some regions that they're shifting away from eelgrass to more um, of the Wigian grass. And so what does that actually mean? Is it providing the same services? Is, is if a fish had a choice, which they do, would it swim and take cover in an eelgrass bed and that canopy? Or is Wigian grass going to provide the same services? 
for scallops, you know, the blades of eelgrass are much wider. If you remember from those photos at the beginning, the eelgrass looks more like the grass on your lawn, whereas the widgeon grass is much smaller. So if the scallops fat, the babies are settling on the grass, is there enough space? So that's some of the concern as well. And so that trickle back up the food web. So if we decrease how much eelgrass is in the bay, are we going to see then an decrease or a crash in some of the other species? And then the last is kind of my googly eyes example. Um, so if you, yeah, if you put a sad face and band-aids, I'm not sure, I haven't figured out how to make that work for eelgrass, <laughs> but if it was possible to actually do that, that might be an additional way that you can get some interest um, by the average person in what you're trying to conserve. But there's still going to be some hurdles. And in the marine world, it's particularly interesting because of video keeps going out here. Um, because of the general disconnect. So it's underwater. <laughs> so on any given day, I can be walking out and I can notice the trees. I can see that there's less beans. I can inquire about those things, but for those people that don't leave, live near the shore, that's one concern. Or if you do live near the shore, what I'm talking about is submerged it's underneath the water column. So some people may not have access to actually see it. So that's where this education piece coming up with campaigns to raise awareness, or I've lately been doing quite a bit of media for it. So I've done, um, this was a couple local news stations doing interviews, talking about the work of raising awareness sometimes couched in other types of stories. And this, um, the grass is groovy is one that came out a couple Sundays ago. And that stemmed from these videos. So I did a live virtual lab for Stockton University as a way to connect with students, given that during COVID times, you know, they're not able to get out in the field with us. And then that was picked that up by the press of AC where Vern um, Agravec did uh, a video. So I'm going to try and show this now. I think if I stop sharing this screen, I should be able to pop into this video and play it. So when you're walking along the shore at the beach, you might see things that look like plants and you're not quite sure what they are. So sea grasses versus seaweed is something that I find myself helping my friends and family identify through photos. And so sea grasses are like the plants on your lawn. They actually have roots and leaves like that. And seaweeds will be fine on the shore that's smelly sometimes, um, don't have true roots and leaves, so they get their nutrients from the whole water column. The seagrass is a really important habitat for fish, so it's a nursery ground for the baby fish. It's a habitat where they can grow and thrive. It stabilizes the shoreline. It brings in a lot of money economically for fisheries, for tourism, and overall, it's just a really beneficial kind of habitat in Barnegat Bay. And so what I'll be showing you today during our Facebook Live Lab session is those differences. So I'll be having that seagrass and seaweed out on the boat, and we're going to be looking at those and helping you to determine who is who and what is what. And then talking a bit about my research, so looking at the monitoring of the bay and the restoration of the bay, so trying to make sure we have more of the, the grasses to support the, the fisheries and the tourism and all the services that we want out of the bay. Um, and, you know, what is the status of the bay now? So uh, some of the surprising things are that we do have grasses in the bay and they're doing fairly well. They're just kind of shifting distributions. So some of those fun facts um, will be what we'll explore today. They're kind of interesting is the Don't Harass the Seagrass, which is kind of a fun name too, where the, the emphasis or the encouragement is that you stay off those seagrass beds, that you avoid them. And when it gets shallow in those areas as you're motoring, it's to, to navigate away from them because those scars that happen when boats come through take a while to heal. Kind of like if you think on your in your lawn, you know, if you if you ran your truck over it and you spun it all up into mud, you know, it doesn't regress doesn't happen overnight. It takes some action on your part. And so that's part of my research efforts as well, is going into areas that maybe no longer have seagrass and trying to understand why is it not growing anymore in that area and seeing if we can't help it along in a natural way. The student responses to seagrass is probably one of the best parts of my job in that they've never really seen it or contemplated it before, but have always lived at the shore. And it's exciting that I get to show them that. We got started doing these live lectures. 
So, so when you're walking oh, along the shore at the beach, you might see things oh, that look yeah. like plants and you're not. Let me go back to hey, Dr. L Dr. Lacey. Yeah, we have two questions. Would you like to oh. take them now or wait? No, by all means. Yeah. Okay. The first one um, is, are there specific juvenile fish species that attach to microalgae or seagrass? Or is it just juvenile fish in general that need the, the seagrass beds? Um, gosh, so That's commercial recreation. So from um, tautogs, from summer flat, flounder in particular are pretty well known. You can find those in eelgrass weight beds, blue crab, and the in seagrass beds versus drift macroalgae. So one of the other projects I did was looking at if we were to collect some of that drift macroalgae, are there fish that are kind of hitching a ride? Um, and so that's also a possibility. So many of the commercially and recreational species are using it, not maybe as a spawning ground, or they're coming back to use it as a nursery ground so they can grow to a size, they can make it off, off that, that nursery area. And the second question is the shift between eelgrass to widgeon grass due to um, too many nutrients or, or certain nutrients that are allow, allowing the widgeon grass to compete better than the eelgrass? Oh, that's an excellent question. I mean, that's kind of the crux of the research, right? Is we see a shift during our monitoring, right? The monitoring is to assess how healthy are, are the grasses and what are the changes happening? And so that one change, that shift has been really interesting to track. Um, and even to my 2020 data that I was just out taking these past few months, is showing something completely different again or a resurgence. But in general, um, you can think of widging grass as almost being the weedy species. So uh, we call it a seagrass, but it's kind of a poser. It's a little bit fake in that it can exist in freshwater and can exist in much warmer temperatures and with less light. So eelgrass can be considered a little bit pickier in that it needs cooler water. Um, and you know that then restricts where it can grow if there's not really good flushing and then it needs quite a bit of light and so that's going to restrict the depth of the water it can grow in. so in some of these regions that it's shifting and we'll get to those results in the monitoring discussion is this idea that in the northern region we have a preponderance of the widgeon grass out in the bay versus in the southern region of the bay we have more of the eel grass and it's that central section that has been interesting to track to see that it, the, the rupia, the widgeon grass, is starting to evade, invade down. Now they're natural species; they're they're fine to be together. My my theory and my thought on it is that that widgeon grass can be initially colonizing some areas that maybe eelgrass wouldn't normally grow because of light limitation. And then once that widgeon grass is growing, it helps to stabilize the soil so that it doesn't get resuspended. And then maybe eelgrass can grow in those locations if that gets to be dense enough to help with that. There are some competitions for space just because they're plants growing on the surface. The rooting depth for widgeon grass is much shallower than eelgrass. And so they're not really competing in that regard. It's more about the space that they can actually get their roots in to start growing to begin with. Good question. Yep, that's it for now. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Um, so hopefully by doing seminars like this and doing outreach events um, and sharing that information, more people are aware of it to, to connect them more, to help them understand you know, the, the, the issues that are going on. Um, the other thing that can be difficult is obviously the, the, the ocean's 3D. So you know, to grow eelgrass, throughout the bay versus, oh, it's only gonna grow in these protected federally or um, you know, nationally and protected areas and refuges and marine conservation zones. Um, well, eelgrass doesn't know that. And so eelgrass is gonna grow anywhere and it's continuous and connected. And the seed source for um, a protected area could be outside of the protected area. And, and so that makes them things difficult. And just as I was saying, we have a shifting species, the boundaries are shifting as well. So the edge between the, the widgeon grass and the eelgrass change. And here we have, this is one of my former students, Jessica, and this is all macroalgae. So you can see that we would get some pretty big blooms. And then part of our monitoring is kind of looking at these are all grass samples within there. And so that gets to this unknown distribution of both animals and behaviors of animals. So 
when there's a lot of unknown, it makes it difficult to decide how you're going to conserve within any one area. And so that's important for us to try and get a handle of before we go in to do um, any type of monitoring or restoration activities. So we were early on questions before. Um, so are there any additional ones or can we hold, hold your on? Hold your on? Um, no, new, no new questions yet. Great, okay. So then the other main, I would say projects, the monitoring I have data for, the restoration projects were supposed to start this year. Uh, but we had to put a pin in those mainly because I rely on an army of undergrads and outreach component while doing the restoration. And so while we have everything in place to start that research, it's not really uh, feasible until we can get our students back in the lab. So that was an unfortunate um, loss for the, the COVID coronavirus time. But I do have the monitoring data um, that I can present now and show you how we can glean some information uh, from this. And so the monitoring um, program, I run two sites every year, and then the sites that I'm showing now are funded by the Barnegat Bay, Bar 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 Bay Partnership. Said your guys' name enough to, I guess. Um, in this case, um, so we're looking at uh, the, these longer term monitoring sites that I've picked up from Dr. Mike Penish and what those trends are, because the trends can tell us some things too. So first to introduce you to where these sites are, is this is showing Barnegat Bay. So this is this region here of New Jersey in this light blue, hopefully you can see that. Um, and so we're in the bay proper here. Each one of these um, numbers with CB in front of them, these are all pertaining to water quality stations that are existing. Like I said before, you know, the seagrass needs light. It needs certain temperature. If there's too much in the water column, whether that be soil that's running off from a river or nutrients causing microalgal blooms, um, we want to know that. And so we tie it to these white dotted water quality stations. And then what might be more difficult to see is there are these blue lines here. And so those were the transects that were initially established. Here, here. Um, those were initial transect stations that were set up, like I said, Dr. Mike Kenish initiated this type of project. Um, and so what I'm showing here is looking at the 2019 data. So this is, you know, hot off the presses. As I said, I'm doing monitoring every year at two stations, but this funded by the partnership is looking at these this larger um, extension of 11 sites. And I've oriented the axis not so that now your head is tweaked sideways and to cause you pain, uh, but more so here we're looking at Zoster Marina. So you, as a scientist, you'll have to excuse me that I keep defaulting to the genus and species, but this is eelgrass. And we're looking at the percent cover. And the reason why I've oriented it this way is because that's what's reflected of these transects. And so number one is one all the way down here in the south end of the bay. So that's kind of behind Beach Haven, if those of you that are um, watching from New Jersey. And then we're moving our way up. Here is Barnegat Light is around um, site eight and then seaside seaside park is 10 12 13 14 15. and so what you can see here this year was our first year that we actually had some eelgrass all the way up here up at site 15 and so that's an interesting development it's not a lot right so we're looking at about 20 22 percent but the fact that we've got it there is something new something that we would miss had we not been monitoring now because this monitoring is only every other year because of budgetary restrictions, who knows if that came in last year or if it came in this year. But it's still interesting, the fact that we have that long-term data is really helpful. The two bars are the spring versus the fall, so the darker bar is spring. And you can see that around site one down here at the, the southern end, it's present, but not in high quantities. We have this kind of increase overall at um, three, six, and eight, so one, three, eight here um, and then a decrease above that that's because lo and behold this is our widgeon grass percent cover so we've got no widgeon grass down here in the southern region in the bay now if you're looking in tide marsh pools there is there would be some rupia there some of the widgeon grass but we're just looking at percent cover of that and so you see that it's really absent and there is this switch over and so this is that transition zone this like 10 and 12 it's where this cool thing is happening where it fluxes and so you can see that come from spring to fall there was an increase in our widgeon grass versus when we're looking at our eel grass it just kind of held steady 
So there wasn't a decrease in eel grass when we had that increase in wood jade grass, but there was something that in, in happening within the water quality parameters, which made it more efficient for that widging grass to kind of take a boom in their population rather than a bust in the population, which is another consideration when you're considering, you know, or looking at, is it going to be rupia, this widging grass, or is it going to be eel grass? Is that um, widging grass is the one that tends to have that boom and bust population. What I mean by that is there's some years we have a massive amount of growth and in the subsequent year, it'll completely die off. And so because we do this, we can only do this every other year. Um, if this is a boom year, next year might be a bust year. You don't really know. Um, and then when we come back in 2021, it could be another increase year. And so, you know, there's some, when you're limited on how often you can monitor, that that's kind of one of the fallouts. But I do think this is a really clear illustration of how that, that transition zone is within that central region. Um, and in looking at water quality in those regions, it's, it's fairly dynamic. Um, and and the, some of the issues are with temperature. What they what research in general has found, and what I've been finding, is that the eelgrass has a, a pretty severe um, negative response to an increase in temperature. So from there, we'll look at some of the algal properties. So drift macroalgae. Remember that photo of my student with her arm <laughs> full full of macroalgae. And so we just like with the, the widging grass having boom and bust years, we'll have boom and bust years of this macroalgae. And so while this looks pretty high, we're looking at 20% you know, cover around site eight, which is once again, that's near Barnegat Light. You can see that there was a, a pretty significant die off that in the spring we get this big bloom and that it dies off, dies off pretty significantly in the fall. And that trend is repeated in a lot of the sites that you've got it in the spring, but come the fall, which is the cooler temperatures, which is not ideal for some of these macroalgal um, mats, that you have that decline. Overall, though, the message from this is, is to see that there's more drift macroalgae in the southern end, but it's still fairly small. It's not the majority. Max is 20%, with the average being much less than that. So then the next would be to look at that microalgal cover. And I talked a bit about this idea of epiphytes, so this epiphytic mold. And epi, think like your skin, epidermis, if you've heard that from your skin. And that means skin. That's a Greek word. Phytic, that F or P H Y T, fight, is loving. So to break this word apart from the science term, it's skin loving. And that just means that these are the types of microalgae, even macroalgae in some cases, that is growing affixed to the surface of the blade. Um, it doesn't have to be just microalgae. A lot of times we've been seeing calcareous worm tubes or snail casings that are growing on it. And that video you saw me mention that there's a tunicate that's covering over it. So you could certainly dive more in depth rather than this broad category of epiphytes. But the general take home from here is similar to our story with drift map algae. You've got more epiphytes, in this case, more epiphytes in the fall and the southern area, and it was a decrease as you go further north. So um, looking at you know, this the general information for the region, you can see that when we try to then make it as an average for the bay, you know, we're, we're, we're taking down a lot of data points and forming it into a smaller and smaller bin and making a statement at the, at the bay level, which as a scientist and knowing the number of hours myself and my students have been in the field collecting all these sites, boil it down and average it all out, it's, it's somewhat painful. <laughs> but because we have historic data that's been separated that way, here we're looking at eelgrass biomass. And I've rewritten the years here, and I'm only looking at the spring data. Um, so 2004, and not continuous, but up to 2019, you can see that there's been high fluctuations. And this is looking at the biomass that's above ground, so that leafy photosynthetic material versus the below ground rhizomes. And this is carbohydrate storage. So it's kind of what the, the plant will pull off of throughout the growing season um, and will use in case it's times of stress. And obviously these error, error bars should be alarming if anyone's familiar with looking at a pretty, pretty figure. You would hope that they have small error bars because that means that the variation that you're seeing in your data points is significantly large. It's very difficult to make those broad generalizations. So as we're looking, we can talk about general trends that, okay, well, it looks like we pretty consistently have higher below ground biomass, 
which makes sense that there's more investment in that below ground biomass, but we don't then see an increase necessarily in the above ground biomass. And this follows through that trend follows through for the fall. Um, we do start to see a decline in the below ground biomass because in the spring it's new shoots they're growing and they're using up that carbohydrate storage throughout the growing season such that you get a, a gradual decrease of it and so the this high variability there's still a story to be told and that you know we have very low biomass here and maybe we're starting to see this increase so this past 2019 data we saw less variability which is good because we can make stronger statements about what the trends that we're seeing. Um, but if, at this point, we can't even say, and our scientific statistics say that it's been an increase throughout the day. But once again, the variability is caused because we're joining all these data points all up and down the coast. So when you've got those areas that have less of the eelgrass because there's more of the Ridgian grass, then that's going to change the results. And so some of the things that I've been doing is restructuring how we are considering the bay and can, um, the zones, considering it more in zones, being a lower zone that's zoster dominated, eelgrass dominated, an upper zone that is Ligian grass dominated and this transition zone in the middle and starting to consider that as maybe three separate regions within the bay, which would then need different types of either monitoring strategy, strategies, but then for management implications. If you have a region down in the southern of the bay with a healthy population of eelgrass consistently growing, then we can protect that area. If you've got an area that's potentially starting to have more and more eelgrass, where it used to be just Wigian grass, maybe that's a great candidate for a restoration because the, the dynamics are shifting. So that canary in the coal mine. The eelgrass is coming back in this region. It wasn't there as much before. So something's happening naturally already. And some would say not naturally and that we've been reducing our, our nutrient load within the bay, but that you've got that resurgence of eelgrass. So let's capitalize on that natural recovery so that we can get more eelgrass in the bay. So that brings me to the last section. Karen, unless there's some questions I should answer. Yes, thank, okay. that's perfect timing because there are a couple about your map. So okay. one, one question, this is actually from Greg. Um, how far back did you look at trans Six, six, 15, go. He says, I recall finding a surprising amount of zoster there and a few patches at 13 back in 2013. So I'm sorry, what the question was? <laughs> he, I guess he's asking how far back did your look at transect 15 go? And then oh. he's, he's just saying that he found, he found some there um, in 2013. Yes, and so it has not been there since that that day. 2015 was when I started, I took over on that project and I've done 2015, 2017, 2019. Uh, and so this is the first year that I've found it while doing those surveys. Um, but yes, looking at the historic data, it's not um, just like with the other, we get resurgences of the eelgrass in certain locations. It's not completely outside the realm of possibility that it's been there before. In fact, that's why it's regrowing is that there was a seed source. We're doing just those one transects, obviously, or regions within the transects. So most likely it's been there in the bay, in the northern area for a while, but not then infiltrating where our sites are. Z? Yeah. I understand. 13 was also uh, a year of recovery post Sandy. And so there were a lot of things, I think. There were some new habitats essentially that were uh, probably being colonized for the first time true lots of soil movement so it could have been in a region that was um too shallow before or too deep before it's changed a lot of times it's it's the flow of water that i'm finding really helps me predict where that grass wants to grow just because it the flow of water is clearing of the water column and a delivery of a cooler water which is helping the growth but yeah that's a good point thanks Dan. And there's one, I think you might have answered this, but this question um, is asking, does the bloom at site 15 of eelgrass indicate changes in the water temperature or just the distribution of eelgrass seeds via wave action or animal distribution? The blue, like the, the blue or the growth of eelgrass at 15? Yeah, he's saying, um, is that because of water temperature change or just the seeds um, being redistributed? 
I think yes. So we kind of answered that, but to yeah. Reiterate, yeah, to reiterate, yeah, yeah. there's changes based on the bathymetry. So the depth of the water or the current could be um it has to be a distribution of seed. So you'll see, you know, from these data points that a lot of these had very little to no. I mean, even in the sites that had some, we're talking 10, 20 percent. And the amount of seeds that need to reach an area to establish themselves have to be pretty pretty um abundant. So we're looking at maybe 350 seeds per square meter for us to get significant growth. And so it could be that, you know, it got wiped out or restructured because of Sandy or changing water temperatures could be because of um, more legislation to reduce the nutrient load to less micro, small micro algal blooms that harmful algal blooms. All of those absolutely could be could be reasons why you'll notice up in this area um, I don't have as consistent these water quality stations. That's another thing that limits me is that I need water quality. And when I'm on site, I get water quality, but it's constantly changing. I'm measuring at one point in time when I need something consistently monitoring, kind of like my Seagraph naturally does. Any others? Uh, yes. There, let's see. Um, are there any information or research on the living criteria for seagrasses? specifically in Barnegat Bay, or does the living criteria, or are the living right criteria the same along the coast in terms of light requirement, water depth, turbidity, et, et cetera? <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what they're asking, but. Um, um, let's, well, so. I think she's asking, or he's asking if, are the criteria, are there specific criteria for seagrasses in Barnegat Bay? Day for the things that they need, like right, like it'll grow to thirty feet and to within eighty degrees Fahrenheit, kind of thing. That if that's kind of the general realm. I'll actually, I'm going to talk about that within the restoration about how we create these these models and these maps about areas that we can restore to. And so, well, you can say yes that there's a depth that we typically find SAV to say SAV because that's both eelgrass and rubia in. I've consistently seen it outside that realm for areas, for instance, you wouldn't expect it at a depth past 30 feet or really past 20 feet. Um, but if the area has really good flow and flushing, that grass can grow deeper because the light in the water column is going to be able to reach it at a deeper depth. So we do have, there's guidelines for all of that that we put into these models, but then we don't try and restrict an area or a completely eliminate an area just because one factor happens to be outside the realm, which is a really fun thing about models. One more. Do the sea nettles in the northern part of the bay affect the seagrass? Do the sea level? Sea, sea nettles. The sea nettles. Yeah. They, they affect the grass and that it keeps people away from my grass. <laughs> um, as part of the don't harass the seagrass, I feel like, because it'll harass you back. Um, with the sea nettles. I feel like that could be part two of that educational campaign. No, there's no, um, the the grasses themselves aren't negatively impacted by the sea nettles. Um, and it, or the, the cleaning jellyfish is the newer one as well. Okay, we're good. Good questions. Yeah, great questions. Keeping me on my toes. So, uh, so this is the last little section of the presentation. And once again, this is where we don't yet have data on uh, the data. We've got some preliminary information, but this is the exciting area that we're going to next. Um, and involves two main questions, where to restore and which method to use. And once again, I um, had the benefit of participating in a workshop from, from the Barnegat Bay Partnership. Um, and you can see uh, photos here that I stole off of Instagram. <laughs> um, and just this idea of bringing together experts and um, governmental agencies, anyone that has kind of skin in the game on seagrass within the bay and trying to determine, okay, so where do we restore? Where would it be beneficial to restore? And to me, first you have to ask yourself, but why is it not there? Because if you can't answer that question, maybe restoration isn't even the best option. Because if you haven't gotten rid of whatever stressor caused that SAV to die off, then why go back in there and restore? And then to touch on all the different methods, and there are quite a few to pursue. So the first question, and this gets to the model that I just referenced. So one of the grants that I have is doing a restoration process 
um, a project and the process first is choosing a site. I mean, that's key. If you're choosing the wrong site, it's kind of like if you, you know, went into your, your lawn as an example and you start planting these beautiful plants running underneath the walnut trees and they're dying. Who knows why they're dying? Or you pick out plants at the store and they say they need uh, full sun and you're putting them in the backyard, which is full shade. So you have to know what's necessary for your plant to grow. And so to get at that last question as well, you know, these are some of the factors. Um, so light, temperature, hydrology, and soil. So hydrology is we're looking at things like currents and wave energy, and then bathymetry, which is the bottom component of the ocean. And what we find is much as I'm restricted in where I have these water quality stations for my monitoring data, we don't necessarily have really great data throughout the bay on wave energy, but we can get more information from wind. And so as a proxy for wave energy, we're starting to use wind. Then we start to look at the soil. So once again, like the grass on your lawn, you know, what's the pH of your soil, the nutrients there, the water, how much shade it gets, and their runoff and things like that. So the chemistry of it, the depth of the soil, is it deep enough to actually let the plant root? Um, and then the grain size is one component, and that actually leads us to the soil type. So just like sand, soak, clay is something that you would assess within your, your land plants. Same story, we're just putting it underwater. Here we have what's called TSS, which is that total suspended solid. So if it's really fine clay particles and you get a storm of that coming through, or if your site is adjacent to a river, you know, you see those plumes. If you ever look at, you know, Gulf of Mexico coming off of the Mississippi River, that's gonna have a problem. It's gonna decrease then the line here to get some light. And that's an impact of the depth. So if it's deeper, less light, and then this chlorophyll A is a metric that looks at those microalgal blooms. And so all of these parameters we put into the model, given the restrictions that are generally understood for seagrass, but once again, not eliminating, okay, this site is this deep, it will never have FAV. Well, if the only thing against that one site is that it's the depth, it could be that there's a counter because of the currents that are there. So we build the model um, and we're at the stage where we have these data points. And so we start to create these layers. So this is a layer of looking at, and this is depth within the, this region, the, Sedge, the Southern Sedge Island. So we're looking at um, Beach Haven right here. For those of you that are familiar, um, Tuggerton, Mystic Isles is over here. And so we're looking at this group of islands here as part of the, the restoration. And then we can different um, levels. So light, we can look at just the, transmission of light, how much is actually getting through um, from suspended solid. So once again, that, that soil that's in the water column or the microalgae that's there, we can look at this into temperature. We don't really want a warm location, um, which relates to depth as well, because if it's shallow, it's going to get fairly um, warm. The soil type, so we know that there's a certain level of sand, silt, clay that the eelgrass prefers. Now, once again, if it's a little bit outside of that, do we strike a site as never being available? No, these are going into these layers for a model, this scientific mathematical model to calculate. And then current is the other area, just the water flow. So the first question, as I said, we've got the model, we have a general idea of where we would like to have it um, to do restoration. And we go there and we think, well, this site says, oh, this is perfect, checking all those boxes. Every layer of that model tells us this is a great location. Why is the grass not here? And one of the easiest ways to do a restoration is within one of these, these blow-ups or these blowouts or crop, uh, crop scars. So in this case, the grass is not absent because this vessel causes disturbance. And so you can actually see these if you did a Google Earth image of a lot of the shallow seagrass beds in Barnegat Bay, you'll see where it's all torn up. Um, and so you can do the sediment tube. In this case, we found, this is a Florida example, you can put a bird stake down as the birds defecate and put guano in the water, it adds a natural fertilizer, um, and then you actually get recovery in that way. So this would be an example of, we know why it's dying, here's how we can restore it. And the model to this or the campaign for this is really well suited for it. So the idea of if you do your part to protect the project, you know, you're not running your crop through the water and losing all this money. Um, it's just an easy way for us to relate to people that if it's shallow, just don't drive your boat through it. Those crop scars cause significant damage that takes, we're talking up to a decade to heal, if not more. The second question or the last question that I'll go over very briefly, are these restoration strategies? And so that's what part of my work is doing is considering the how. And so this is a little graphic talking about, you know, 
seeds, they need to germinate, and then eventually they become seedlings, and then there's juveniles and adults. And so these are actually what eelgrass seeds look like. And here's a handful of hundreds of them. And remember, I said, if you're using seeds, you need upwards of 350 per meter squared for a chance to develop. And so one way we have collect the seeds, you put them in this mesh bag with a cinder block and a buoy, and then these will naturally fall out of, out over of time. This is a, a setup within a lab facility. You go collect them, you put them in these bins and let that outer covering of the seed naturally fall off. Then you collect the seeds, you put them in these little burlap bags, and then you tie those down. So that's one method with seed. Another is with seedlings. So you can grow those in a lab, just like a greenhouse. Um, this helps if you want to do some type of genetic work. So you can breed for different types of strains of eelgrass, or really, if you haven't done it with eelgrass, starting to. Um, but considering, okay, this one's really heat tolerant, and we know that's a stress in an area. So let's go ahead and, and cross fertilize to make sure we get the strongest strain resistance to um, heat potentially. Um, and then you can plant those, or you can, this, these women are tying it onto mesh racks and then planting it out. Um, and then the last mention for me is to consider the interplay between um, the shellfish and the SAV. So if you remember from the beginning, the interplay between the two, there's also an argument to be said with aquaculture gear. So here we see some examples of, these are cages on floats. This is rack and bag over a bottom. So clearly no grass is going to be able to grow below the bag. But the argument, and this is a very involved figure that I'm not going to spend time on because I want you to see how many factors are at play. But the idea is that if you were to have this, this either the, the rack itself, or here's an example of some muscles, you see these divots in the sand, meaning that the current flowing across this area is really strong. And had these, these animals, organisms not been there, the chance that an eelgrass blade would settle is pretty diminished. And so that's called a boundary layer here. So the currents coming across, it's going to hit these, you know, whether that's an oyster reef or these cages, it's going to slow it down enough that behind that, you will have some settling of the eelgrass seeds that can potentially take root in an area that would other not, otherwise not have that success. And remember, you're still getting the benefit of the, the grass or the oysters, which are filtering the water column. You know, some of them are stabilizing the sediment when it's natural. Um, there are certainly still some negatives to aquaculture in that, you know, the, the harvesting procedure when they're walking in between the racks can disturb some of the soil, but there's something to be said about an area that maybe the current's not right, that there's too much suspended solid, so back to that model, those layers, those layers are telling us no, but if we put out gear, it might be a yes. Um, and you can do this naturally as well, so here's that shellfish again, and the benefits between the two. Um, and helping for each of them to address the challenges for oyster restoration is that there's not really the substrate. They could be smothered because of um, the, the, the soil and the water column. There's even ideas about the CO2, the absorption of the CO2 by the eelgrass helps preserve the pH near these shellfish so that they're growing and their calc is not calcifying very well, unless you have some grasses present to help mitigate that. So the results for this one, I can't share because <laughs> they're not there yet. Um, but uh, it, to me, it's an exciting area to explore rather than thinking, thinking single species restoration, thinking a bit outside the box, being a little bit more holistic and looking at all these communities because then you also get the benefits of the fish uh, using one habitat and other types of fish using different habitats. So that's all that I have for you today and I'm happy to take more questions. Uh, one question came in, what are the measures for success criteria for eelgrass and widget grass? Uh, success criteria for restoration, I'm guessing. I think so. They didn't, they didn't use that word, but I think that's what they mean. Right. Uh, well, and I think it will vary on what the objective of the project is. So to me, if I'm thinking sustainability in terms of, then I end up thinking more of a manager, because I want to, if I'm going to do something as a scientist, I don't just want one shoot. I mean, you could say, well, one shoot per square meter, it survived, but is that really going to be sustainable? Um, so to me, it would be the idea that it's a, it's a seagrass bed that's persisted over time. And that's where we tend to get in a little bit of trouble with the research projects as well, is that it needs to be funded longer term. These are slower growing species. So um, if I were able to get um, a, a bed established that persisted for five years, um, that would help make me feel that they had been a success. 
of course you want it longer for five years, but steel grass actually has a two year cycle of growth uh, in that the seed, like for instance, the growth that I saw in this year in 2020, I'm looking back at my water quality from 2018 to determine what was going on in the system and 2019, it's not just only 2018, but it takes two years for that grass to mature enough to produce the seed for the future growth. So the criteria for me would mainly be a persistent bed that becomes reproductive, you know, over those five years and starts to spread. It doesn't get, you know, taken out. So that is it. There is one kind of a funny story. It's not really a question, <laughs> but it's from Bill Roberts. He says that in the summer of 1976, he took a marine phycology course at Stockton. He collected, preserved, and displayed the specimens he collected, and he still has it. And he says the colors are still well preserved. And when he showed them to his biology class, one student noted that the collection was older than she was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good yes, that's a good story. That's a good story. Well, and that so the art show that I curated in Florida, um, Fort Jefferson is um, in the Dry Tortugas off the Florida Keys. And they, I partnered with the National Park Service, the State National Park, and I was working with a tropical botanical artist group. And um, they were looking at my pressings, but then they actually went in the archives. The National Park Service had archives of the prisoners because it had been used as um, a hospital and a prison at one point, Fort Jefferson did. And they still had the pressings and they, they displayed them and it was just phenomenal. Definitely, definitely amazing to see how long that those last. Very cool. And uh, that's, that's it. We, you got a lot of questions along the way. So I guess you already answered them all. Good. And so take note too, if you've got, um, you know, uh, I can, this is the, the URL or whatever for my Instagram page. So you can find me there or um, my email address is my first dot last name at stocking.eu or it's on the publicity material. So if you find anything on the beach and want me to help identify it, I'm more than happy to do that. Or if you have further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm more than happy um, to do that. Um, I also just want to mention that um, we recorded your talk. Um, so it will be the link to the recording for anyone who wants to hear it again or someone that missed it. It will be on that webpage, Ask a Barnica Bay Scientist um, webpage on our on our website. I'll be adding it probably tomorrow. So. Um, and I just want to say thank you, Dr. Lacey. That was, that was so enjoyable. I learned so much and I think everybody else did and you got some great questions. So we really appreciate your taking the time to come and share your expertise and your research with us. Great. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for the partnership really for supporting this work. It, it's one of those underdogs of research areas and that it's not as flashy potentially as the commercially and recreationally important species. So without the assistance of the partnership, it, we really would not have found some of the answers and identified some of the problems. So thank you. And then Stan, did you want um, Dr. I just say thanks Z for a great presentation. We look forward to working with you and keep up the good work. Thanks so much, Stan. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. All right, have a good night. Bye.